most poetry always left me cold. I didn't, I didn't really understand it. I felt like it was going over my head or something or under my legs. I wasn't grasping it. I always liked Dr. Seuss, but when I heard Ginsburg's poetry, I right away connected with it because he was speaking of a, of a language that was familiar and describing a landscape that I recognized, which was not surprising since we lived in the same, same two block radius for about 30 years. I always saw him around. It was during a police riot in 1988 that I had my first conversation with Alan. The police were trying to enforce a curfew on Tompkins Square Park. People were chanting, whose fucking park? Our fucking park. Bottles were flying, the police were like on horseback, galloping into the crowd. So during this apocalyptic scene, I see a taxi cab pull up on Avenue A and Alan steps out, like, like wearing his glasses, all bald and kind of bewildered. So I rushed up to him and explained to him what, you know, what was going on. So I wandered through the neighborhood with Alan, uh, talking about William Blake and talking about America's uh, draconian drug laws, and different things like that, when suddenly the police charged and I lost Alan in the crowd didn't see him until a few weeks later. After that first meeting we had, I showed him some of my work, and then he recognized it. He said, oh, you're the guy who's been doing all of the street posters. I've been collecting those. I've been taking those home with me. So he suggested that we collaborate on a street poster together. And then I said, hey, how about let's do a whole like, book project together? Like, your words, my pictures. And he went, yeah, okay, let's, let's do it. So he just kind of gave me access to all of his poetry, basically trusted me to illuminate his words. The whole body, including a lot of poems that hadn't been published yet. And Alan had suggested that I illustrate part two of Howell, the Moloch sequence. I think he saw that it, in my work that there was a connection that had that kind of sinister, big metropolis look, that kind of corporate monoliths of the city. And I remember that I cried when I got to the line of Moloch, whose eyes are a thousand blind windows. I don't know why, but that has haunted me ever since. Maybe it's just I'm such a city boy, born and raised in Manhattan Island. There is, I think there is this terror that we feel, people in the cities feel but could never express. The horror of simply being born and raised in a metropolis, where you're this little vulnerable flesh and blood creature, but you're surrounded by these 50-story towers, corporate towers. I studied who Moloch was, and is this ancient god of war. And as I started doing it, I was thinking, okay, maybe the Minotaur, the head of a bull, you have Greek mythology. But then I was thinking, how do I bring it up to date and make it contemporary? And so it ends up in the, what looks to be like Iraq, the Middle East. So that's the, ch you got the child sacrifice right there into the mouth of hell the fiery, the flames of the burning oil fields of Iraq. One of the magical things about poetry is that it's so uh, image, uh, the language is so rich that it conjures images in the, in, 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 in the mind of the listener. You almost don't want an artist telling you what his interpretation is. So I think a different approach would be to just have images that re loosely relate to the poem. But for the most part, I think the pictures should just bounce off of the words. I think most of the first chapter is going to be just single, solitary figures doing weird things. 
walking past factories and things like that. And then he walks into kind of a skid row part of town where there are a lot of neon lights, bars and things like that, flashing lights. Kind of vaguely a reference to Herbert Hunky. And it's Herbert Hunky who's credited with, who Jack Kerouac said he first heard the term beat. That it was that it was Hunky said. He said, ah, oh, man, this is this is a beat generation. He was this kind of con man, hustler, you know, this petty thief. But of course, Alan was friends with all of these marginal characters. If he liked someone, he would just be friends with them and be kind of loyal friends with them and help them out, regardless of what their status was. Anyway, it seemed like it all went into the mix. All of the marginal characters, all of these people who were filtered out from the mainstream America in the 50s, everyone who wasn't on, on, on uh, Father Knows Best, all of the uh, sexual outlaws, sexual deviants, people who used drugs, people who uh, had radical politics, people who just didn't, who you didn't hear about on the TV were the people who Alan gravitated towards and wrote about. You know, he was filling in the gaps. What do you think he'd have to say about what we're up to? Yeah, I, I think he, he'd be pretty excited about it because I know that he, he was a bit of a movie head himself. He used to talk about how he, when he would meditate, the difference between meditating with your eyes open and meditating with your eyes closed is that the imagery becomes much clearer when your eyes are closed, like being in a movie theater, was the example he gave of just watching your thoughts go by. So just observe, like be a passive observer. And I was thinking it might be funny to have a scene where there are guys on, riding on motorcycles, but they're naked. They're all dressed up like motorcyclists, but except that they're not wearing clothes. It might be kind of a comical effect. And you don't get to do that in any of the, you know, the Disney movies frown on that kind of thing. Because it's supposed to be fun for the whole family. Wouldn't want kids to see a naked person, because they might grow up and want to be naked themselves someday. We have to be very careful what we show our children.